Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us wherever you are in the world. My name is uh, Michael, and on behalf of Whale Coast Conservation, a very warm welcome to all of you wherever you are joining us from. Here in the Overberg um, in Hermanus, it's a beautiful spring evening, and those of you who are joining us from this area, thank you for not being outside and joining us inside. We were actually hoping to do this um, conversation live and then stream it to those of you around the world from our premises at the greenhouse but due to the challenges with COVID we thought we'd rather be safe and so for the next foreseeable future we will continue to do these virtual calls. I want to remind you that this conversation is being recorded and um, so you are welcome to share it with um, friends and families and normally it takes a day or two to load onto the platforms on YouTube and Facebook but please share it when you can. You will remember those of you who joined us a month ago that Professor Mike Bruton um, had a wonderful conversation with us about finding old forelegs, the coelacanth, and the people behind the story and he has very kindly um, offered to join us again this evening. He is a scientist he comes to us this evening from Hermanus. Uh, talking about science, it can often be seen to be quite serious and somewhat dry. But Mike is going to tell us the other side of science, um, the funny side. So over to you, Mike, in Hermanus. And thank you again for taking the time to join us this evening. We really look forward to hearing the funny side of science. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, and can you confirm you can see the image and the sound is okay? It sounds perfect and I can see the image clearly. Thank you. All right. Well, it's great to be with uh, your community again and to share, as Michael says, some insights into the other side of science. I think we all regard science as a serious business. We tend to put it on a pedestal and regard the practitioners of science as something almost people who are almost superhuman um, and not like ourselves. And um, you know, we see science as a sort of remorseless daily grind to some unachievable goal. But that's not the case. Scientists are people. And in fact, I would argue that scientists are abnormal people because many of them have found safety in science in order to escape uh, society. And here are just a few of them. Uh, on the far left, nine o'clock, you can see Robert Oppenheimer, uh, who was a famous nuclear physicist in charge of the Manhattan Project, who lost his security clearance because of his communist leanings, and was a pioneer in starting the International Science Center movement. There's our Pythagoras, who we all know him for his theory, but he, one of the things he studied was the length of strings in string instruments in music and how that related to uh, the tones that they produced. I'll speak about Newton later. There's Watson and Crick who first developed the um, helical model for DNA. Linus Pauling who won two Nobel prizes, including a Peace Prize. Louis Pasteur who was a bit of a sloppy chemist uh, and some of his results uh, um, were derived by accident. Marie Curie, the first woman to win a Nobel Prize, the first person to win two Nobel Prizes, and her husband and daughter also won the big prize, and of course, old Albert Einstein. So science is full of the sort of vagaries of human personality, and all of these characteristics will come through in my talk. Now let's start with Archimedes. He's perhaps most famous for the fact that while taking a bath, he noticed that the amount of water that's displaced um, was equal to the volume of his body that was immersed. And that led him to uh, solving the problem of whether King Heron's um, crown was made out of solid gold or not. And he ran down the street sh shouting, Eureka, I found it. And that's become the kind of call of scientists. But what Isaac Isimov and others have pointed out more recently is a more exciting exclamation from a scientist is, that's funny. In other words, that's funny that that result or that observation doesn't fit into uh, the known universe. 
And so, you know, the funny side of science actually gives us a great deal of insight into the way in which science is practiced and the peculiarities of some of the people involved. Now, Archimedes um, was a great inventor, and one of the things he was reputed to have done was to um, burn the invading Roman fleet by reflecting the sun's rays onto their sails and, and, and burning the ships. And this was thought to be impossible until over a thousand years later when it was tried and found to be perfectly feasible. Another good one to start with is Democrates, the laughing philosopher. Now he was so far ahead of his time that nobody believed what he proposed. He proposed, for instance, that all matter is made up of indivisibly small particles, which he called atomos, which means they can't be cut, and that these atomoses were constantly moving and could form into different materials. Um, it took over a thousand years before his ideas were finally accepted, which is probably why he died laughing. Now, Aristotle was a different kettle of fish. He had the opposite problem in that everyone believed everything he said. Such was the elitist Greek culture at the time. But Aristotle had a problem in that he followed the, the, the methodology they used at the time. In other words, everything was derived by rational thought and he never experimentally tested his ideas. And as a result, he came up with some absurd notions which everyone nevertheless believed. For instance, that women play no role in the conception of children and that women are um, not as good at, as men at thinking. He proposed that earthquakes result when earth escape, uh, air escapes uh, from the earth and um, that the brain was used to cool the blood and all thoughts come from the heart. So he had some crazy ideas, but because he was such an elite scientist, everyone believed him. Now, we know very little in the Western world about the fantastic contributions of Islamic scholars. And this was an amazing fellow, a zoologist, Al Jaiz, from the ninth century. He was a very well traveled chap who climbed up the Himalayas and looked under the sea. He wrote a 10 volume book on, of animals. And he, in fact, anticipated Darwin's theory of evolution many centuries earlier. And sadly, he died at quite a ripe old age when a pile of books, a shelf of books, fell on his head. Uh, Ibn al-Haytham was another famous Islamic scientist. Um, he accepted a contract in Egypt uh, from a pharaoh who, who wanted him to tame the waters of the Nile. It was a rather foolhardy contract to accept, because after one trip up the Great River, he realized that this would be quite impossible. He also knew that the Pharaoh was a cruel man and that he, if you did not uh, fulfill his wishes, he would chop off your head. But he also knew that it was illegal to execute um, insane people. So he pretended to be mad. And in fact, he pretended to be mad for about 18 years and he was put under house arrest. And it's during that time that he did some of his most amazing research on the properties of light. And you might remember about six years ago, we all in celebrated the International Year of Light. And that was to remember that 1000 years ago, Ibn al Haytham published a book called The Book of Optics, which really defined the modern field of optics. And it's interesting that another scientist uh, who, who made some of his greatest discoveries one, while, while under house arrest um, was Galileo. Uh, Ibn al-Haytham, one of the things he invented was the camera obscura, uh, which he, he, he made in order to make a model of how the human eye works. And he used the camera obscura to show that light travels in straight lines. And it was effectively the first camera. Now, moving on quite a few centuries, this is an unusual fellow called Tycho Brahe. He was a famous Danish um, astronomer. And among many other things, he was the first to observe and record an exploding star and to explode the myth, as it were, that uh, stars are unchanging. And for this great discovery, the Danish king actually sponsored uh, 
two astronomical observatories for him. But unfortunately, Brahe was an argumentative sort. And in those days, arguments between scientists weren't settled in the boardroom or through published papers, but through duels. And in this case, it was a duel with swords. And Brahe uh, confronted his adversary and unfortunately had his nose chopped off by the adversary's sword. So nothing daunted, he went down to the astronomy workshop and fashioned himself a new nose out of silver. In fact, he made several noses for himself out of different metals. And some centuries later, when historians doubted that this in fact was the truth, they rather bizarrely dug old Tycho Brahe up from his grave and lo and behold, they found his silver nose buried there. Now, Leonardo da Vinci was a sort of brooding Renaissance um, polymath, an expert in painting and sculpture, in art and music, science and engineering. But he, is not, he wasn't a very successful inventor. In fact, most of his in so-called inventions couldn't be made at the time, either because the materials didn't exist or the technology uh, wasn't available but mainly because they were flights of fancy that wouldn't have worked even if they had been made. Uh, for instance, he, he created a ornithopter, which was a, a kind of a helicopter with helical um, blades. And because it had no tail rotor, it would simply have gone around and round. But although he was a man of peace, sadly, the inventions that he did make that were most successful were weapons of war, like three-barreled cannons and five arrowed uh, crossbows and an armored car that was driven by men walking underneath. Now Francis Bacon was a, a rather a weird fellow. He often fell out with the uh, aristocracy, but he was a very bright man. And the one story I'd like to relate is that he was traveling in a carriage with the king's physician. And he decided that he wanted to test whether a chicken put on ice would remain fully preserved. So they stopped, bought a chicken, got some ice and put the chicken in the ice and found, lo and behold, the ice preserved the chicken perfectly. Unfortunately, this didn't apply to Bacon, who subsequently died uh, of a cold. Now, Isaac Newton is known as one of the great scientists and we know that he lived during the plague when he was forced to go into the countryside. That's when the apple fell on his head. Um, he was a, a mischievous youth and a cantankerous and argumentative old man. For instance, in his youth, he used to cause mischief in the village by uh, um, lighting candles, putting them inside paper lanterns, and then floating these lanterns off so they set fire to the thatched roofs of nearby houses. Even as a youth, he was very absent-minded. His maid once came into the kitchen and saw Isaac staring into a, a pan of boiling water. And in, in the pan was his, his watch and holding in his hand was an egg. Now he later in life became the master of the Royal Mint, which produced the British currency. And he became very involved in trying to uh, undo the conspiracies where people were chopping bits of metal off coins and then melting them down to make new coins. And he was in the habit later in life of sort of um, lurking in dingy pubs in London, trying to find these thieves who were chopping up the coins. But eventually he solved the problem by making the first perfectly round coins with milled edges so that you couldn't obviously chop bits off and, and, and regard as for, um, reliable currency. Now there's Newton in all his glory um, in later life, um, a great scientist, but very, very eccentric. Um, Robert Hooke lived at the same time as Newton and made many famous discoveries, but in fact, he's hardly ever known because he's totally eclipsed by the fame of Newton. Uh, but Hooke himself was a rather obsessive character who, who didn't want other people to know what his results were in case um, they got the credit. So he used to hide his results in codes and lock them away in cupboards or in the vaults of the Royal Society. 
Now, mentioning the Royal Society, this is probably the most prestigious scientific body in the world. But in their early days, they did some rather bizarre experiments, which would be regarded as totally unethical and cruel today. For instance, uh, some of their scientists in the company of, you know, leading politicians and, and other senior citizens, they would inflate dogs with air to see uh, whether they would explode. I mean, imagine that, it's absolutely terrible. And they, there's even a record of them doing an experiment where they pumped sheep's blood into a student who had volunteered for the experiment. And fortunately, uh, the student survived. But uh, the Royal Society has moved on since then. Now, here's an artist's impression of an epic event. The man in black in the, in the middle is Alexandra Volta, who developed the first means of storing electricity called the voltaic pile. And he's demonstrating it to Emperor Napoleon, seated on the left in the blue tunic. Now, of course, electricity is a natural phenomenon. It's all around us. It's in electric eels and electric torpedo rays. Uh, every plant and animal sends messages around it uh, using electricity. But Volta's contribution was to be able to contain it and release it um, on demand. And that was very exciting because suddenly electricity could be in the hands of scientists to do experiments, but also laymen to do all sorts of bizarre things. Um, I'll come back to Anton Lavoisier. Uh, Benjamin Franklin is, was one of the scientists who did experiments with electricity. Here he is with his famous kite experiment on a rainy day. There's electricity around and he's got a key there and he was able to show that lightning is, is a form of electricity. Uh, but this was a very dangerous experiment to carry out. In fact, several scientists who did it after him uh, were killed um, trying to do that experiment. We go back to Lavoisier. Now, Lavoisier was a famous uh, a chemist. He really pioneered modern chemistry and quantitative methods but he was an extremely arrogant and pompous man. Um, in fact, he came to a rather sticky end, partly because of his pomposity and in his inheritances through which he um, took taxes off uh, Parisian people that he was actually executed during the French Revolution in 1794 at the guillotine. But one of the pranks that he got up to was that he dispelled the so-called phlogiston theory. Now, phlogiston was a fluid which a German scientist called George Stahl had proposed is the flame that you see in, in, when a, a fire burns, for instance, a candle flame, that that is phlogiston. And Lavoisier showed that this is not true. And he actually held a mock trial where someone dressed up as oxygen, um, you know, poo pooed this whole theory and they uh, burnt all Stahl's books um, in order to get rid of it. Now, the French Revolution led to some rather bizarre experiments as well. The fellow on the right is Giovanni Aldini, uh, who was a researcher at the time, and he set up a laboratory right near the guillotine during the French Revolution. And something that would be thought, you know, totally unthinkable today is he had an assistant who brought the newly chopped off heads of people to his laboratory, and he quickly did experiments on them to see how long the brain survived. That's how peculiar some research was in the past. Now, here's the man after whom the guillotine is named, and Joseph Guillotine was in fact a, a medical doctor, and by all accounts, a gentle and kind man. And he actually supported the use of the guillotine because it was a more humane method of killing people than the methods that were used at the time, such as flaying or dragging behind someone behind a horse on a cobbled road uh, or hanging on a noose. So his name is unfortunately attached to this dreadful machine, even though he was a, a very good doctor. Now I mentioned the bizarre experiments that were carried out after uh, Alexandre Volta's voltaic pile had been invented and here are some examples of that where electricity is being passed through people and i've even come across an account 
where in, at the Palace of Versailles, the electrician, uh, and they even called that in those days to Louis XV, arranged for 148 French guards to join hands in a giant circle. And he then passed a massive electric current through them, and they all jumped into the air in unison as if in a ballet. Uh, it's an example of the, the weird ways in which people experimented with electricity at the time. Now, here's another eccentric scientist, William Buckland. Uh, he was a zoologist who, who worked on living animals and also fossils in London, but he had rather bizarre culinary tastes. In other words, he liked eating unusual things. And he had an arrangement with the London Zoo that whenever an animal died, they would keep a fresh bit of flesh for him, uh, which he could then serve to his family and to his guests at home. So when you came to have dinner at the Buckland's house, you could get dolphin or rats or, or chimpanzee or whatever had recently died at the London Zoo. And there's even a story that a friend of his, who is the Archbishop of Canterbury, had bought the embalmed heart of King Louis XVI during the French Revolution in Paris and brought it back to England. And he showed it to Buckland. And in a flash, without anyone being able to stop him, Buckland snatched the embalmed heart of the king and swallowed it. Can you imagine that? Now, here's William Runchen, who in uh, the late 1800s was doing routine experiments with cathode rays and so on. And he noticed that some photographic plates nearby were becoming clouded. And he couldn't understand what was doing this. And in those days, if, if something couldn't be understand, it was called X. So he called them X-rays. And wisely, instead of X-raying his own hand, he X-rayed his wife's hand. And you can see that top left with the wedding ring clearly shown. Now, Rudgen's discovery revolutionized uh, medicine because it allowed non-invasive um, surgery, as it were, to look inside the human body. And um, it's also used in material science and so on. But for every great discovery, there are other people who missed the boat. And there's one famous British scientist who observed exactly the same thing as Rudgen. In other words, these mysterious rays cause photographic plates to cloud. And what did he do? He simply stored the photographic plates further away instead of finding out what caused it. So he lost out big time. Now talking about x-rays, um, the 3D x-ray machine, the CAT scanner, was co-invented by two uh, scientists, Godfrey Hansfield of England and Alan Cormack of South Africa. Alan Cormack was South Africa's first nuclear physicist. He worked at UCT and uh, Friedrichsky Hospital uh, and did a lot of work also in the USA. And uh, uh, the original uh, algorithms for the CAT scanner were developed by Cormack and then Hounsfield took it to the market. But the funny twist to this story was that the company that Godfrey Hounsfield worked for was called EMI and they had two divisions a medical technology division and a music recording division. And it so happened that just at that time, EMI had contracted an insanely popular group called the Beatles. So the Beatles, the success of their record, helped to fund the development of the CAT scanner. And by the way, it's probably the most famous invention uh, co-created by a South African and is regarded as the 53rd greatest invention of all time. Um, just while I'm on x-rays, another x-ray machine developed in South Africa is called Lodox, which is a low-dose x-ray machine developed by the De Beers Mining Company. And it was developed primarily to stop um, miners stealing diamonds, or as they said, to reduce the risk of diamonds, uh, of, of miners using diamonds as a dietary supplement. Now let's go back a bit in time, and this is to Sir Humphrey Davy, he was a famous uh, chemist and, and physicist uh, in England. And in addition to making many important discoveries, he also was a pioneer in bringing science uh, to the public as we're doing now. And there you can see doing a demonstration uh, in London to the uh, Linnaean institution. 
but he was also um, also uh, involved in some rather um, odd activities. And here, Sir Humphrey Davy is doing a demonstration of laughing gas, nitrous oxide, which causes gross flatulence. And you can see there, you know, sophisticated people in the audience even making notes about this bizarre event. But probably Sir Humphrey Davy's greatest contribution was introducing Michael Faraday to science. Faraday became one of the great experimenters and um, made many, many important contributions, but started life in a very humble way. He was an assistant to a book um, maker, and he used to steal moments while he should have been binding books, reading scientific texts. And he applied for a job with Humphrey Davy, got the job, and went on to develop uh, the first electric motor, uh, the electric dynamo, and, and all sorts of other things. And he was once asked when uh, show, he showed the electric dynamo uh, to uh, a senior official, uh, he was asked, what use is it? And Faraday famously replied, what use is a baby? In other words, let's not judge it now. Let's see where it goes in the future. And there's Faraday giving his famous Christmas lecture as he continued the tradition of Sir Humphrey Davy of taking science to the public. And probably his most famous lecture is on the chemistry of the candle. And you can still get that lecture or versions of it on the internet, and I encourage you to do so. Now, once again, let's go back a few years. This is Dmitry Mendeleev. And you may remember that we all celebrated the International Year of the Periodic Table of Chemical Elements. And that was his discovery. Uh, he was a, a famous uh, chemist and, and, in fact, industrial uh, chemist and engineer um, in Russia. One of the things he developed was a submarine. He was also a very avid card player. He loved the game of patience, for instance. But what he was uh, trying to unravel scientifically was how the chemical elements were ordered, which hadn't been solved at that time. And the one way in which he did it is he wrote down the symbols for all the chemical elements on his playing cards and then on a table in front of him he tried to sort them into some sort of pattern and he just couldn't get it right and then one night in a dream the uh, correct order of the chemical elements in the periodic table came to him and when he woke up he wrote it down and he subsequently said only one part of it was in error that he had to correct now, this is not totally um, out of the question because a number of scientific discoveries have been made while people were dreaming at night or daydreaming. And uh, another example is uh, a scientist called Kukuli who came up with the, the circular structure of benzene uh, in a dream. And Freeman Dyson, who's famous for his work on interactions of some atomic particles, pulled together all sorts of complex ideas while zooming through the uh, the countryside in, in the USA uh, in a bus. Now let's look at Thomas Edison, who is defined as the, the man invented the future. Probably the greatest inventor of all time with over a thousand patents to his name. Some of his early inventions are shown in the top right, a, a, a kind of mechanical doll and a, a ticker machine for counting votes, which would have been useful in the USA at the moment. One of his most famous um, inventions is the phonograph. Now, sadly, when Thomas Edison was young, he used to um, make money by traveling on the railways and selling newspapers, but he often got into trouble because he'd do experiments on the trains and cause fires. So he was boxed around the ears and uh, became partially deaf. In fact, by the time he was adult and had invented his phonograph, he was almost completely deaf. And it's recorded that he used to listen to the sound of his phonograph by biting into the wooden case of the machine to listen kind of through his jaw bones. And to this day in the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, you can see some of his phonographs with his bite marks in them. Now, how is this for a famous photograph of an inventor's picnic? Bottom left, you have Henry Ford, and then you have Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell and Harvey Firestone, all of them great pioneers in their field. Our contemporary of Edison was Nikola Tesla, 
who is an absolutely brilliant man, but he didn't have the marketing and business management skills of Edison. For a while, he worked with Edison, but they fell out because they had totally different approaches to science. Edison is famous for saying that you know, invention is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. And Tesla would respond, well, if he spent you know, less time perspiring, maybe he'd have more time being inspiring. They also battled over, for instance, how the best way to uh, transmit electricity. Um, one uh, supporting direct current DC and the other one AC. Eventually Tesla won that battle, but sadly by the end of their careers, they, they couldn't have been greater contrast. Edison uh, was one of the most celebrated scientists and technologists of all time. When he died, the lights in the USA were switched off uh, for a minute. Tesla in contrast died in poverty in South America with very few friends. One of them, interestingly, Mark Twain. Now let's get on to Charles Darwin. He's probably the scientist who influenced the worldview of more non-scientists than any other scientist. And we all know about his theory of evolution uh, by natural selection. But he was a very abnormal scientist. He didn't ever work for a university, uh, a research institute or government department. He did almost all his work from his country home, downhouse, and of course, on his trips on the Beagle and other um, excursions. He was very much a family man. And when you read his diaries and the books about him, a lot of the experiments that he did around his garden were with his children. Uh, one of them involved um, them dousing bumblebees with flour using a feather duster so they could chase after the white, white and dumb bumblebees to see what, how big their home range was. He would mow different parts of his lawn at different in, um, intervals and then lie on his belly with his children, counting how many insects there were in the different parts of the lawn. He even did experiments to determine whether earthworms could detect vibrations um, and, and, and he effectively hear music by placing bottles of earthworms on the piano while his wife was playing. And another experiment he did was he, he wanted to replicate the mechanism inside orchid flowers, whereby when a bee comes into the flower of an orchid, a trigger flicks pollen onto the bee. And if, because they didn't have plastics at the time, what he did was he cut slivers of whalebone off his wife's corset in order to make these trigger mechanisms of the orchids. Um, Darwin was a very uh, sort of reclusive sort who hardly ever attended conferences and so on. So other people put forward his ideas and defended his ideas. And one of the most famous of them was Thomas Huxley, who's known as uh, Darwin's bulldog on the right. And one of the famous adversaries was William Wilberforce, uh, who was a prominent cleric and the head of the Church of England at the time. And there was a famous debate in about 1860 in the Natural History Museum in London, where uh, Wilberforce mocked Huxley and Darwin by, you know, saying, you know, are you really saying that your grandparents were, are descended from apes? And Huxley responded along the lines that, you know, it's a tragedy when someone with such intellect as Wilberforce should use it to deride a, a, an important scientific um, discussion. So poor old Darwin suffered a lot of ridicule in his life. He has a cartoon of him. Uh, but his ideas have lived on and all the evidence that we've gathered since then has uh, shown him to have been right. Now, interestingly, Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, had anticipated some of Darwin's ideas on evolution. But he wasn't really a scientist. Um, he was a medical doctor. And um, he wrote his thoughts down in poetry. And one of his poems actually talks about how life might have orig originated from simpler forms into more complex forms. Now let's go into a totally different field. Here's Guglielmo Marconi, uh, the inventor of the radio, which of course revolutionized our lives. But it wasn't easy. He had a great deal of difficulty and hardship in proving the value of his uh, invention. And in fact, the day that he, he showed that it really could be used 
for international communications. He was camped on the east coast of Canada in Newfoundland, um, and he had his antennae up waiting for a signal. And he'd kept his whole mission secret by telling people, oh, they're just communicating with ships offshore. In fact, what he was trying to receive was a Morse code message from Cornwall all the way across the Atlantic Ocean um, in England. And above the crackle of the static, they detected uh, the Morse code coming through, and that was the first long distance um, radio message ever received. And one of the reasons why people thought that this was unachievable is because the curvature of the Earth would cause radio signals to bounce off into space. But what we now know, of course, is they bounce off the ionosphere, part of the atmosphere. And what is, of course, of interest is that Hermanus is one of the principal places in the world where the ionosphere has been studied. Now, Alexander Graham Bell, he invented the telephone. Uh, his father was hard of hearing, and he, they were both involved in, in helping people hard of hearing, and uh, he developed this device. But once again, he had trouble uh, having it accepted. And um, this is, for instance, the comment of Sir William Priest, the chief engineer of the British Post Office. The Americans have need of the telephone, but we do not. We have plenty of messenger boys. And in fact, the Americans responded in a more positive way when the mayor of Chicago said, along the lines that we think it's a very useful device and we anticipate there'll be one in every, every American city. <clears throat> now, Albert Einstein was voted as the man of the 20th century and uh, was really one of the greatest thinkers of all time. But he was also a rather odd sort. Um, at school, his teachers regarded him as um, lacking concentration, always adrift in his dreams. Uh, he, he didn't do particularly well at school. And interestingly, as an adult, he never learned to drive a car. And another person who only learned to drive a car late in life was Henry Ford, who, of course, created one of the most popular cars of all time, the Model T Ford. Albert Einstein rather preferred to ride um, his bicycle. Um, there are many things one can say uh, about Einstein. And one of them was a confession he made as to why he would have been the one to discover special and general relativity. And he said, it's because I had a retarded development. While you know, other adults had moved on to adult things, as an, as an adult, he was thinking of the things that kids think about and trying to um, take his thought experiments um, into the bigger picture of the, of the real world. And what's not generally known about Einstein is that almost all his discoveries were made through thought experiments and not through direct experimentation. He left that experimentation to others to do. And of course, what's important is that that experimentation supported uh, all his concepts. Ernst Rutherford was a New Zealand physicist from Christchurch who did some of his best work at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge in, in England. Uh, he was a very opinionated man who made some statements which are quite controversial. One of them was that um, physics is the only science, everything else is stamp collecting. Uh, something with which I strongly disagree because I, I think in every discipline of science, there are stamp collectors and there are people who deal with the real difficult um, principles. But Rutherford also said something that I agree with. And he said that if a scientist cannot explain a scientific concept to a barmaid, then there's nothing wrong with a scientific concept, but there's something wrong with a scientist. And uh, that's, that's an important lesson uh, for all of us. Now I'd, look, I'd like to look at something quite different, not so much funny, but peculiar, and in fact, rather tragic. And there've been several cases of it. This is Kamala, a child who was brought up by wolves. She had a younger sister, Amala, as well. And these two children were brought into a, a home in a mission station where they attempted to kind of educate them into becoming humans. But sadly, Kamala and her, her younger sister who died early, 
never became human. They continued to walk on all fours. They preferred raw meat. They were restless, uh, sleeping at night and preferred to sleep during the day. And sadly, they had been hardwired to become wolves. But here's an even more tragic example of how science can go wrong. Two, in the 1930s, two American social scientists, the Kelloggs, decided to bring up their little son with a baby chimp. And they treated the chimp in exactly the same way as they treated their son. Dressed the chimp in, in, in human clothing. He sat in a, a baby chair at the table and ate uh, with the rest of the family, slept in a bed and so on. And the tragic outcome of this experiment is that they had a very well-behaved chimp and a totally out of control son. Eventually, they were forced to get rid of the chimpanzee and they tried to bring up the child as best they could. In fact, their son became a sociologist in his own right, but at the age of 30, committed suicide and in a long suicide note, blamed his parents uh, for uh, causing it. Uh, yeah, two famous scientists, in, in both physicists and both um, equally sort of bizarre. Pauli was um, notorious for his critical comments on other people's work. Uh, you know, he was once asked, you know, is this something that you would support? And you know, he'd answer along the lines that your ideas are so muddled that I don't know whether they're nonsense or not. And he and Bohr had many famous debates on, 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 on topics about physics. And in one of those debates, uh, Bohr said that he had basically solved all the problems in particle physics. And Wolfgang Pauli said, you know, in order to totally upset any field, your work needs to be totally crazy, totally out of the park. And they then spent the rest of the, this particular conference arguing whether the ideas were crazy enough. Now, Niels Bohr, uh, he spoke English, but with a very heavy accent. And as a result, when he went to conferences in America, they would do simultaneous translation of what he was saying from English into English. Uh, he, to he sp spoke a kind of English which uh, became known as Boer. Uh, it was so unique. But another interesting thing about him is that he won the Nobel Prize. I think it was in about 1923. And at the beginning of the Second World War, he was in Copenhagen. And at the time, it was illegal to export gold from Copenhagen. But he had his gold um, um, Nobel Prize. Um, so what did he do? He popped it into a jar of, of acid. And of course, it dissolved in the acid. And then several years later, he went back to his laboratory and there on the shelf was the same bottle of acid. He, rem he subsequently got the gold out of the acid and the Nobel Committee agreed to recast his Nobel Prize medal. Now, many scientists are very absent-minded and some, I mean, this fellow looked totally respectable and normal. Uh, Neville Mott, he was a British physicist who won the Nobel Prize, actually for work that he did after retirement. But he was notoriously absent-minded. Um, there was one account where he would be giving a lecture at the University of Cambridge, writing on the blackboard, and he would continue lecturing long after the students had left the room when the, the lecture period had ended. But another example is a classic of his absent-mindedness. He went to London one day, and later that day, he found himself sitting on a train going to Bristol. And while looking out the train's window, three thoughts came to mind. The train's going to Bristol, but I actually live in Cambridge. Secondly, this morning, I drove to London in my car. And thirdly, I had my wife with me. Now, uh, here are three famous scientists. Um, and the one I'm going to talk about is John Bardeen on the left. He was an amazing man, extremely humble. And there's an account that one day he came home to supper and he mentioned to his wife, I think we discovered something today. And that's all he ever said about it. And then about six years later, his wife heard 
that he co-won the Nobel Prize for inventing the transistor. And just another example of his humility, for 20 years, he played golf with the same partner. And as they hit their balls around, they would chat about what they're doing, etc. And then eventually when Bardeen died, his golfing partner was at the funeral and learned for the very first time, A, that Bardeen was a scientist, secondly, that he'd invented the transistor, and thirdly, that he'd won not one, but two Nobel Prizes. Uh, here's a, an example of an outstanding South African inventor. And if you haven't heard about him, I strongly encourage you to Google Trevor Wadley and uh, find out uh, what he did. And I've shown this picture of him with one of his inventions called the ionosond, which was used right here in Hermanus to study the ionosphere. Um, Wadley lied about his age and got into the Second World War in the Signal Corps, uh, under 18 years old. And he made such immense contributions that he was promoted from a lieutenant to a major within four years. And what he did is still not completely known, but he made major contributions to radar and radio and communications between the troops and the headquarters in London and elsewhere. Uh, one of his many inventions was the Barlow Wadley uh, broadband radio, and his commercial radio receivers and transmitters were in fact used by the BBC for many years to broadcast their programs around the world. But his most famous invention, shown on the right with Wadley in the hat, uh, is the telerometer, which is uh, an earth measurer. It's, it's a device using radio waves that makes very accurate measurements of distance. And I've shown the slide of Harold Macmillan because on the bottom left, um, Wadley was asked to demonstrate his um, telerometer in England. And he, he not only showed his most accurate distance measuring device in the world, but he also showed that two stakes on Salisbury Plain which were the basis for all British surveying, were, had been measured incorrectly by 1.5 meters, the distance between them. And Macmillan was horrified by this and also asked, you know, why didn't we invent this? How come some um, colonial came up with it before we did? Okay, we don't, okay, we've done that. Well, South Africa mentioned a few other South African inventions. Lee Dickman from Port Elizabeth, he invented the first telephone recording machine, the Colon Dicta. Uh, it was very successful in South Africa, but he wanted to introduce it into England as well. So he took it over there and he actually arranged to demonstrate it to the Duke of Edinburgh, who was a well-known tinkerer and the Queen, uh, which he did. And they were so impressed that they bought one on the spot. But sadly, that was the only colon dicta that he ever sold in Europe because the uh, British post office stole the idea, uh, produced a similar machine, and he was never able to penetrate the market. Graham Wolf of Pupina Maritzburg, he and a, a colleague invented oil of Ule, which is a lanolin oil derived from sheep's wool. Um, and they formed a very successful company which made products purely for women but there were only men on the staff. So what did they do? They created a fictitious woman staff member who never existed, but who wrote press releases and, and answered letters and all sorts of things just so that they could pretend that there was a woman on the staff. Today, Oil of LA is owned by an American company and it's a billion dollar industry. Now, what about Cyril Ramaphosa? I'm not saying he's an inventor, although he is a very innovative man, but he is a, a highly um, um, enthusiastic fly fisherman. And a special fishing fly has been um, tied and it's called the Ramaphosa. And of course, it's, it's tied in the colors of the ANC, black, green, and yellow. Now, I'm coming to the end. You'd think that no one could patent the wheel. Well, a cheeky young patent attorney in Australia decided to test the Australian patent office. So he submitted a patent with this pathetic drawing of a rotationary um, motion device. And to his surprise, he was granted a patent. 
And this is notwithstanding the fact that in the rule book of Australian patents, it says before submitting a patent, please examine all similar inventions that have been made before you so as not to reinvent the wheel. <coughs> now, the Nobel Prizes, of course, are the epitome of achievement among scientists, but there are also something called the Ig Nobel Prize, which honors research that first makes people laugh and then makes them think. And there on the right, you can see the tradition. Uh, Peter Boss is receiving the Ig Nobel Prize, and the tradition is a young lady called Miss Sweetie Poo constantly interrupts him while he tries to deliver his acceptance speech. And some of the ridiculous things that uh, people won the Ig Nobel Prize for was one scientist calculated the, uh, the velocity of a coconut when it falls from a tree and uh, hits you on the head. Another one examined the, the love life of clams by feeding uh, Prozac to them. And here are just some other examples of funny research that's been carried out around the world. The junk mail that Americans receive every day would produce enough electricity to heat 250,000 homes. 92% of Americans believe in alien invaders. I'm surprised it's so low. Uh, the buzz generated by an electric razor in Britain is in the key of G, but is in B flat in America. And worldwide, most toilets flush in E flat. Imagine doing research on that. And the five most beautiful words in the English language, mother, passion, smile, love, and eternity. Here's some other funny research. The average smell weighs 760 nanograms. Wearing headphones in your ear increases the bacteria 700 times fold. And old Bill sent only two emails, one to launch the email and one to John Glenn. Um, and this fellow, Chris Zilnicki, studied the fluff inside 5,000 people's belly buttons. I wonder if he got a research grant for that. And the value of all the chemicals in your body is 93 rand 75 cents. Yeah, just a few more. Every megabyte sent over the internet needs two lumps of coal to power it. Termites will eat your house twice as fast if you play loud music. And that word is fear of long words. And some birds have eyes that are bigger than their brains. And the sound you hear, and I'm sure you all know this one, when you put a shell to your ear, is not the sound of the sea, but the sound of blood flowing in your head. Here are some answers, to, uh, crazy answers to exam questions, which showed how sometimes understanding of science can go awry. The pistol of a flower is its only protection against insects. Joan of Arc was burnt to a stake. Blood flows down one leg and up the other. There are three kinds of blood vessels, arteries, veins, and caterpillars. H2O is hot water, CO2 is cold water, and nitrogen is not found in Ireland. It's only found in a free state. So humor is an important part of science. I think it, it helps to lighten the load to make us realize that scientists are also normal people. The chap on the left here dressed up as Einstein is my active friend, David Miller, and there's uh, with the then Deputy Minister of Science and Technology, Dr. Heinekom. And, uh, you know, I think the best definition of humor is it's the shortest distance between two people. There's even a science of humor where people study what are the elements of a good joke. And here they are, provide an element of surprise or incongruity, have a culture, culture outcomes, uh, dealing with societal taboos. They create a sense of superiority in the teller and they prick someone else's pomposity, someone like Anton Lavoisier. They make you feel good at the expense of another and they mock people who make you jealous and they um, release your feelings of repression. So those are sort of deep scientific thoughts about what makes a good joke. And of course, we do funny things in science centers and museums. Here's a bizarre display on snot, the stuff that comes out of your nose in the Canadian Science Center. And Gary Larson is famous for his cartoons where he turns everything on the head and he has a sea creature about to crunch a submersible uh, in a nutcracker. And here are sharks bringing home supper in the form of a scuba diver. And uh, the, the, all about the, this uh, idea of what is humor, it's a superiority uh, hypothesis of everything versus everything, English versus Irish and brunettes versus blonde, etc. 
South Africans versus Van der Merwe. But oddly enough, there are no jokes about Jews versus Scotsmen. Now, there was a competition in England a few years ago about the funniest joke ever. And of course, that's a very cultural thing. But the one they decided was the funniest. I don't think it's particularly funny, but I'll tell you anyway. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson were out camping one night. And they had a braai and they ate their supper. And then they went off to bed in the same little pup tent. In the middle of the night, Sherlock Holmes suddenly woke up and he shook Watson. And he said, Watson, Watson, what do you see? Wake up, what do you see? And Watson woke up and he looked up and he said, oh, I see stars. And Sherlock Holmes said, well, what do you deduce from that? We said, well, there are lots of them. And if there's so many of them, probably one of them has got life on it. And Holmes said, no, you idiot. It means someone stole our tent. <clears throat> right, so there are lots of interesting anecdotes and amusing episodes in the history of science. I've had a chance to share some of them with you. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, that, was, that was really funny. Uh, if any of you have any questions, please won't you put them in the question and answer tab or the chat tab. Mike, you've spoken a lot about um, other people's um, anecdotes. Uh, were there any from your own in your long scientific uh, life of uh, doing research and work? Well, one I will never forget, and it's anyone who lives and works in the bush knows that things go wrong in threes. So if two things have gone wrong, the best thing is to go to bed. Uh, but on this particular occasion, I was up at a remote lake in Zululand working with a chap uh, on Bilhazia snails, and he had gone out early in the morning to do his research, and he walked back rather bedraggled late in the day to say he'd got his Land Rover stuck. So we went out in my old Land Rover and tried to pull him out, and in the process, I got stuck. So the two of us then started walking back. On the way back, I saw an unusual snake, which I picked up, and it bit me and pumped its poison into me, and happened to be the only snake, a mole viper, that you can't hold behind the head that puts its fang outside its jaw. So I walked along with this rapidly expanding black hand, and we then heard some one murmuring in the undergrowth next to the road, and we came across an African man with a broken leg who'd been run over by a hippopotamus. So our day went on. Uh, eventually, our wires came to fetch us. It took me to the local hospital where I had a tetanus injection. And the last thing I had to do that day was to take our workers back to Mabibi village. And on the way, I ran over a python and crashed into a tree. So <laughs> that's the sort of thing that can happen uh, in the bush if, if you're not too careful. <laughs> I'm just uh, trying to get to some of these questions while, I, while we chat. Um, are you saying you really enjoyed the presentation? I'm just trying to get to the next one. I don't understand the statement that blood goes down one leg and up the other. Can you explain that to Laura? <laughs> well, that, Laura, that was an example of a crazy and wrong exam, exam question answer by someone who doesn't know how the blood circulation works, because quite obviously it can't go down one leg and up the other. Um, do you think, uh, you know, part of the part of the way you do become successful in science is to add a bit of humor. Has that been something that you've used in teaching um, people and, and uh, in the work that you have done? How essential is it, have you found? I think it's absolutely essential because you've got to uh, get rid of that barrier between you and your students. You know, you may be a senior scientist and they're at the beginning of their career. And you've got to get rid of that barrier. And it really is a wonderful way of diffusing um, any tension. And I, I think that's something that a lot of science communicators and researchers have used. David Attenborough has been very much in the news of late, and I was very fortunate to meet him uh, at the British Museum when I was doing my postdoctoral there. He used to come and uh, have uh, you know, crustless cucumber sandwiches and a cup of tea with my, uh, the head of my laboratory. And he often talked about the importance of humor in communicating science. It's such an important a good way of diffusing tension and, and, and getting people to connect with one another. So I, I think it's essential. <laughs>
I agree. And are there any other people like maybe George Hughes or others, the Turtle Man or other sort of um, current day conservationists or scientists that you can share other anecdotes with that people you might know? Oh, I've got some wonderful stories about George, but he'd probably take me to court for telling them. I, I can remember one occasion up at Bunga Neck in Northern Zulaland, right in the beginning of his turtle survey work, he was holed up in a little hut and I was spending the night there and helping them with their surveys. And uh, we had perhaps a little bit too much wine. And there were rats in this hut, rats running all over the show. And the only weapon we had to get rid of the rats was a spear gun. So we rather um, rashly tried to spear a rat and the little knowing that the spear had gone into an electric cable. And when we tried to pull the spear out, we were both almost electrocuted. So, you know, that's something that happened in a remote little hut um, in Zululand. But yeah, um, you know, in every incident that one is involved, there's always some humor. Uh, even in, in my coelacanth research, um, on one occasion, we, um, we left our vehicle near the shore and we were uh, walking along the shore talking to coelacanth fishermen in Grand Comore. And we came back to our vehicle to find the Kwanda movie cameras had been stolen. So we reported this to the guard president Tal and uh, they went to the local chief, uh, village chief and said, we're coming back in an hour. We want all the equipment that was stolen to be here on your front porch. So we went away and come back in an hour's time. And there on the front porch was a pile of stuff that had been stolen in the last 10 years unbelievable number of cameras and other things that had been uh, the villagers decided to sort of admit uh, that they had taken and we actually had quite a lot of trouble finding our stuff. Thanks Mike and I also think it's a really fun the ability to laugh at oneself isn't it and not just yes. the humor but just to diffuse situations and and um, it's very much common ground I know when we make films it's something that's really important. Uh, I see we're losing the light here and we've just gone over time. So thank you so much. Enjoy Hermanus while you're here. Hope you find many fireflies and enjoy the beautiful spring weather and the flowers. And thank you for taking the time. That was a, a lot of work that went into that presentation. I learned a lot. I laughed a lot. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you everyone for joining us. We'll see you in a month's time. Goodbye. <laughs>